Hey, Storyline. I don't know about you, but the first day of school for me as a little boy was rather traumatic. I remember clinging to my mom as the teacher had to pry me off of her body as I was crying my eyes out. And then as I went into the classroom, it was an extremely uncomfortable environment because it was a new environment to me. But it wasn't the environment that was as uncomfortable as what happened next. Because as the teacher called my name from the front of the class while calling roll, I had to respond to that name in this new environment. And the name was Ty Ross. Ty Ross. That name you would think would be no problem at all, but, but that name identified me in, in a particular story, in a particular narrative in a particular setting, and that was the home in which I lived. There was all kinds of abuse and insanity because the guy from whom I received that name, Charles Ross, was a guy on the one hand who was the kind of guy that a little kid would look up to. I looked up to him, but he was a kind of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde because on the one hand, he was funny and cool and we did all kinds of amazing things with him. He taught me how to surf as I began to get a little bit older. But then, with every shot of vodka or Kessler's or Jack Daniels, this guy would become a monster. And the words would fly and his fists would fly and it was a crazy environment. And the name Ty Ross was embedded in that narrative, in that story. But then something crazy happened. One day my mom after years of writing my name, Ty Ross, at the top of my papers through kindergarten and then first grade and then second grade and then the third grade, my mom told me something that completely rocked my world. She sat me down and she said, your name's not really Ty Ross, your name is Ty Gibson. And she told me about another man who she said was my father. She showed me my birth certificate. And right there on the birth certificate, there was my name, Ty Gibson. Not Ty Ross, Ty Gibson. And she told me about a man who treated her well and, and somebody that she loved. And for whatever reason, they didn't stay together. But that was my dad. And a new story was now presented to my mind. There was Ty Ross and then there was Ty Gibson. And there was a sense in which I was so relieved to be called by this new name. Because what was happening for me is I was being, in a very real sense as a little boy, I was being called out of one identity into another identity. A new story, a new script was being written for me. I could now relate to somebody else, even though I had never met this Johnny Gibson guy. All I knew is that he never hit my mother. All I knew is that he was kind to her. By, by her own word, he was an amazing guy. And that was my new story, my new identity. Something very much like this is true of all of us. There's a sense in which the gospel of Christ is a call out of one identity into another identity. Think about how Peter explains it in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. You are a chosen generation, selected, chosen. I want you, a royal priesthood. There's some kind of elevated status here of royalty and priesthood, something big and lofty and amazing to live up to and live into, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That word holy means distinct, different, completely other than whatever is the norm. A holy nation, his own special people. And then Peter says this, that you may proclaim the praises of him who, and here's the word I want you to notice, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The word called here is the word I want you to just fix your mind on with me for a moment. The word is kaleo in the Greek. And the word literally means to call or to name, to, to call out of one identity into another identity, to, to name according to one's potential, rather than according to one's current reality. 
kaleo. Peter says we're, we're called out. Kaleo is the word that defines the shift from one identity to another, from one name to another. So I'm going to suggest to you that the church is an identity incubator. That's point number one. Secondly, I'm going to suggest to you that the church is a fellowship of love. And thirdly, that the church is a theater of grace, a stage upon which experiments of mercy and grace are playing out real time in the world. So this first point, the church is an identity incubator. An incubator, what's an incubator? An incubator is an environment that is calculated or fine-tuned for growth and development. An incubator is used for children that are born prematurely in order to give them a fighting chance, in order to create the exactly perfect environment for them to be able to survive and to grow and to thrive. So the church is a kind of incubator for growing new humans. New humans that specifically love like God loves. That's what we're called to. The kaleo of our calling is a re-establishment of our minds, our hearts, and our lives, the way we think, the way we feel, and the way we relate to others in the image of God's love, in the image of God's love. This is really the essence of the gospel, you guys. This is the essence of the gospel. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 17, notice the language. It's strange language. But notice this language carefully where Paul says, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Here's our word again, kaleo. God calls those things which do not exist as though they did exist. I mean, how strange is that? I mean, something's either true or it's not true, right? But... In the gospel, God proclaims things about us that are true in Christ, and we're then nurtured in the incubator of the church to grow up into, to be nurtured into, to thrive toward the identity that we have in Christ. Now, Paul, in his context here, he wants us to understand that this, this calling those things which do not exist as though they did exist falls into two basic categories. We are called innocent even though we're guilty. We are called righteous even though we're sinful. And this sounds like fiction. It sounds like, I mean, how can God say something's true that's not? Well, because there is power in the grace of God to make true that which at any current moment is not true. So the gospel is a kind of prophetic word, a word that foretells an identity that can become a reality as we tune into the environment, the incubator that is provided for us in the church according to the dictates of Christ regarding what the church ought to be. Think of these luminaries in biblical history. Abraham, I mean, what do you know about Abraham? Abraham, well, at first glance, if you just read this brother's story, Abraham was a liar and a coward. Just go read the story. And yet he wasn't. And yet God called him. God called him out of one identity into another, out of lying and cowardice into truthfulness and courage. But, but this wasn't true of Abraham when God called him, except in the sense that it was true of Abraham according to God's heart, according to God's posture toward him. And what about Isaac, the son of Abraham? Isaac, I mean, seriously, you wouldn't let this dude babysit your children. Isaac, look at the way he raised his kids. He was a dysfunctional father on an extraordinary level of disaster. That's Isaac. And yet, there are other things that were true of him according to God's heart toward him, according to God's posture toward him. 
Isaac was a dysfunctional father who was called out of his dysfunction into the beauty of a new identity in Christ. What about Jacob, the son of Isaac? Well, read his story. His narrative was one of manipulation and theft. This guy was a pretender, man. He was the kind of guy who would pose as someone he was not, namely his brother Esau, by which he manipulated the birthright to himself away from his older brother. And yet there were other things true of Jacob simultaneously, things true of him according to God's heart toward him, according to God's posture toward him, things like innocence and righteousness that did not belong to his native or natural self, but did belong to the identity that God was conferring upon him. And what about Moses? I mean, Moses is a towering figure in scripture. And yet, read his story, and he was a murderer turned coward, running off into the wilderness in order to save his own hide. And yet Moses was more than this. And in a sense, he wasn't this at all because God related to him and called him as if he were not a murderer and a coward. And what about David? You know his story, that whole episode with Bathsheba and Bathsheba's husband who was conveniently taken out of the way so that David could take that man's wife? I mean, this is, this is David, King David, who becomes a symbol, a type of the Messiah that is to come. And yet David, the murderer and adulterer, David was a guy that God called to a new identity. What about Peter? I mean, what are you going to say about Peter? Peter was a loudmouth hothead. He said everything that popped into his noggin as soon as it popped into his noggin. This guy had an extreme case of what we might call verbal diarrhea and mental constipation simultaneously. He wasn't thinking clearly, but whatever popped into his head just came out of his mouth. Jesus literally had to say to Peter at one point, get behind me, Satan, <laughs> because Peter made himself a mouthpiece for the devil himself. And yet... Jesus called Peter. He called Peter innocent and righteous in his relationship with him, in his attitude toward him, in the relational dynamics by which he related to Peter. And what about, what about John and James? I mean, these guys were a couple of pieces of work, weren't they? Hey, let's bring fire down from heaven and burn up this whole town because they didn't want to host the presence of Jesus. I mean, what are you going to say about these violent dudes who just wanted to literally rain fire on a village? And yet, Jesus called them in Matthew. I mean, maybe he was the worst of all. He was a tax collector. He was an IRS agent. This guy was betraying his own people by pilfering money from them continually in order to enrich himself. Matthew was... All of that, and yet he wasn't, because the gospel of Christ conferred upon him an identity that transcended the things about him that were horrible. And Paul, Paul was a self-righteous Pharisee by his own admission, and he presided over the murder of Stephen. And yet Paul was the very guy that God said, I want you. I want you. You're the one I'm going to use. And then what about you? What about me? Fill in the blank. I don't know what's true of you. You know somewhere in your deep, dark subconscious if you bring it to the surface. You know that there's some, there's some stuff about you that is very uncool, that is very untrue to what you wish you could be. You know that there have been significant breaks in the integrity of your character, your relationships in your life. You know that. And yet, and yet, whatever you're going to put in the blank, here's what Scripture says. Scripture says that, that while everything you know to be true of yourself that imposes guilt and shame upon your conscience, Scripture simultaneously says that you are perfectly loved by God in Christ, according to John 3.16. The same scripture says that, 
that you are crucified and risen in Christ, Galatians 2 and verse 20. And what about this? You are, according to Scripture, accepted in Christ, in the beloved. That's, that's Paul's name for Jesus on certain occasions, especially in Ephesians 1, 6. Jesus is the one who is the beloved of the Father, and we are accepted as beloved in Christ. It's remarkable. You are forgiven and redeemed, according to verse 7 of Ephesians 1. You are more than a conqueror, according to Romans 8, 37. Not just a conqueror, more than a conqueror. I mean, are you getting the vibe here? And then just take it vertical. I mean, literally vertical. You are enthroned, according to Paul in Colossians 3, 1. You are enthroned at the right hand of God. The right hand is the position of favor, you guys. You are enthroned in the position of authority and favor at the right hand of God. So you are in Christ what you are not in yourself. And that is the essence of the gospel. The word gospel, of course, means good news or, or glad tidings or happy message. The gospel of Christ, you guys, is the good news that God confers innocence and righteousness upon you and me, although we don't deserve it. And in that good news calling, we are called out of one thing into another. We're called into a fellowship, according to scripture, a fellowship in which the vertical relationship I have with God bleeds over into the horizontal relationship that I have with you and every other person in my proximity. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9 says it this way, God is faithful. I mean, you're not, I'm not, but God is. And because God is faithful, we are called, we were called, past tense, by the gospel into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. We're called, that's our word kaleo again, out of one environment into another environment, out of one fellowship embedded within the false narratives of guilt and unrighteousness into a new kind of reality, a new kind of identity. And then that fellowship that we have with one another in Christ, in which we are, you know, mastering the art of loving like God loves, that church environment becomes a theater of grace, a stage on which God is experimenting on human hearts. And the experiment reveals that we can become so much more than we are in our natural selves. The church is a theater of grace where unmerited favor is on display between undeserving people. Every one of us within the fellowship that is the church, within the identity incubator that is the church, every one of us is completely undeserving of grace and forgiveness and love. And yet it is lavished upon us by God in Christ. And things begin to happen inside of us. We begin to experience the effects of God's grace. And the church becomes a kind of theater that the world and indeed the whole universe can look upon the stage that is the church and see a group of people, a ragtag band of ragamuffins, individuals who are undeserving and yet it is the fact that we are undeserving of his grace that most highly recommends us to God's grace. He says, you are exactly the kind of people upon whom I'm going to lavish my love. And the world looks on and hopefully they see in every local church in, in storyline as a worshiping body, as a royal priesthood, in every other church that names the name of Christ. Hopefully they begin to see that that this is a place where new identity can be formed in a non-condemnatory atmosphere 
where there's no incrimination, where there's, where there's no judgment, where there's acceptance, where the issues that we have are worked out under the influence of grace. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, the Apostle Paul delves into the grace of God as the essence of our calling. I marvel, he says, giving the Galatians a little bit of a verbal spanking here. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who, here's our word kaleo again, called you into the grace of Christ and you are being soon turned away to another gospel, to a different gospel. And Paul says, really, it's not another. It's no gospel at all, really. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. And if you read on, the way that the gospel of Christ is being perverted is by judgment and condemnation within the church. People are taking up a salvation by merit orientation. The church was becoming a meritocracy like the world. And that meritocracy was ruling some out and incorporating others in according to their worthiness. And so the grace into which we were called was replaced with a system of earning God's favor. And Paul says that's not good news at all. In fact, that's bad news if you think about it. Bad news that, that, that God's favor is to be earned. Listen, there is one simple and profound reason why you can never earn God's favor. Because you already have it. You can't get God to love you any more than he already does because God already loves you with the totality of his love. And there's nothing you can do to make God love you less than he does. Because the moment we find ourselves in guilt and shame and sin, the grace of God overwhelms our sin and we stand before God innocent. So the world is defined by merit and retribution. I mean, just spend, just spend any amount of time on social media. I mean, we live in a world right now where judgment and condemnation is going vertical, you guys. People are just lashing out at one another for every mistake imaginable. We live in a culture that is merit-based and therefore it can only be retribution-based. But, but the church by contrast, and this is the key point, the curse, church by contrast is defined by grace and forgiveness. You mess up and the people of God are called upon not to lean out, but to lean in. You fail? Well, the incubator of the church to nurture a new identity goes into high gear to give you the environment you need in order to get back on your moral feet and to move forward. There's a book written like a hundred and some years ago called The Acts of the Apostles based on the book of Acts and the New Testament church. It's by an author by the name of Ellen White. Now I find it fascinating that on page nine of that book, she defines the church as a particular kind of environment in which something is going to be seen. She says that the church is the medium through which, check out this language, the final and full display of the love of God is going to be given to the world. That's on page nine and then she goes on and she fills out this concept and she says the church is a theater, a theater of God's grace in which, notice this beautiful language, in which he delights to reveal his power to transform hearts. And his grace is that transformative power by which we're made into something so much more than we are by nature. Listen, you are called. I am called. We are called out of one identity into another identity. When I heard the name Ty Ross, my first day of school, spoken by the teacher, everything in me wanted to shut down and run. But when my mom finally told me, hey, that's not your identity, you're someone else, you're something else, your name is Ty Gibson, and, and I could 
I could latch on to a whole new story in which I didn't have to be the kind of person that Charles Ross was in our home. Well, you guys, that was revolutionary for me. That completely changed the trajectory of my life. My mom had conferred upon me a call, a calling. She kaleoed me, I guess you could say. She gave me a new name, something to live up to and live into. You and I are called into Christ. We're not completely sorted out yet. Everything's not going well for you and me. You do have defects and you do have sins. You have things that you're not proud of. You have breaks in your integrity. But listen, in Christ, you are provided with the perfect environment in which you can grow into the goodness and beauty and love of the character of God. Storyline, that's your calling, that's my calling. Would you pray with me right now as we pause to receive the identity that we have in Christ? Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you that you have called us out of darkness into marvelous light, out of the darkness of an identity that is defined by, by guilt and, and by sin and into an identity that is defined by innocence and righteousness. May we begin to see ourselves the way you see us, Lord, and, and to grow up into all that you have provided for us in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.